So thank you, everybody. It's uh, great to see everybody here in person, um, at least partially. I know there are many people online. I hope you can hear us. Um, so it is my great pleasure really to have Joe's son talking to us today. Um, is the most amusing part about introducing people is you learn things you didn't know about them. And I didn't know that Joe was born a little bit north of here, um, contiguous to the Canadian border. So he grew up in Vancouver, Canada. Um, he did his undergraduate work at UC uh, Berkeley. He did his PhD training in immunology under Michael Bevan at the University of Washington. And then he was part of what I call the Lewis Lanier machine um, at UCSF for a while. He is currently at Memorial Sloan Kettering. And as he told me at breakfast this morning, everybody has a dual appointment with Cornell Medical School. And he has a position there in immunology as well. Um, he has been really acclaimed in the field for at least the past decade. Uh, being wed to the NK cell field and expanding really our mechanistic insight into how NK cells work. Joe, I always get amused by people's first academic paper, and yours was entitled Post Exposure Chemoprophylaxis Against SIV Infection of MOX as a Model for Protection for HIV Infection. You weren't a first author of that paper, but that's the first one you have listed on your CV. So it's really with great pleasure that we would love to hear the work you're doing. And thanks for coming to Minnesota. Thanks, Joe. Thank you all for coming. It's been fun to see some old friends and um, to meet some new folks. <clears throat> it's funny that Jeff mentioned that paper. That that one on HIV was um. Yeah, I don't think about that much. I was a technician at the time at the University of Washington before I went to grad school. And um, this was, I think, in the mid 90s, where, you know, that there was this idea that we could maybe come up with a CD8 specific vaccine for HIV, which, which as I think most of you know, um, has not really panned out. But <clears throat> it caused me to start thinking about questions pertaining to T cells and, and the ability to generate memory. And, um, you know, just as a show of hands, how many grad students are there in the audience? All right, so, so just so you know, this slide I made as a first year grad student in Mike Bevan's lab, and we were interested in this uh, interesting curve, which I think everyone in the audience knows um, refers to the clonal expansion of naive T cells to become effectors, how they contract and become memory cells, and then they can uh, be boosted to drive uh, memory or recall responses. And this is the basis behind uh, vaccination. And um, some of the questions pertaining to the different stages on this curve um, we're still answering today and we're still asking. And so um, hang on to your slides from your first year. You never know how long, how far it'll take you. Um, and now if we were to overlay um, innate immunity on top of this curve, it might look something like this, where um, the magnitude of the response when you encounter a pathogen the first time or the second time or subsequent times uh, doesn't change. The kinetics and magnitude highlighted in this graph um, remain about the same. And as, as you know, under textbooks, basically what's not a T or B cell is lumped under innate immunity. This includes NK cells, dendritic cells, macrophages, myeloid lineage cells, and granulocytes, and basically anything that's not a T or B cell. Um, but we know that NK cells do come off the branch of the common lymphoid progenitor, <clears throat> um, similar to TNB cells. So they're basically siblings of TNB cells because they have the same parental cell. And so it, it caused us to ask whether NK cells might possess some of these features of adaptive immunity that has been described for BNT cells. And to highlight some of the work that uh, our group, um, Louis Lanier's and Wayne Yokoyama's and, and others have done over the years. Um, this cartoon depicts a subset of NK cells, 
um, that recognizes viral infection, our favorite model being cytomegalovirus, which in, in mouse um, allows expression of this viral glycoprotein M157. And the subset of NK cells that bears Li49H, uh, an activating receptor, will sense this. So there is a, a bit of antigen specificity in, in this system. Um, and then Wayne Yokoyama and Ray Welsh showed a couple decades ago that this subset can undergo a, a clonal type of expansion. And uh, our group has subsequently found that this expansion can be quite substantial. It can be on the order of um, 10,000 fold or even 100,000 fold in certain circumstances uh, from a single NK cell clone. And this, this almost rivals what you see with some of the immunodominant T cell responses. And then following this expansion, um, we showed that um, these cells will contract similar to effector T cells and form this memory pool I'm putting memory in quotes so I don't offend folks like Steve or Mark or others <laughs> that's, that work on T cells. And then we showed that these cells can even be recalled. And so this highlights that NK cells can have these adaptive responses that have been described for T cells. Um, the human counterpart to this, so humans also um, get infected with cytomegalovirus, um, and the subset of NK cells that recognizes um, viral infection um, expresses the NKG2C receptor. And so it's, it's a little bit um, different than Li49H, but the responses are analogous. And folks like Jeff and others have shown that you can get these, these uh, substantial proliferation of these compartments and, and longevity in the cells as well. Um, this is an early study by the late Christine Byron when she was a fellow, um, and this was um, a, a patient described in the 80s that had a normal T and B cell compartment, but specifically lacked NK cells. And what she came down with was a severe herpes virus infection in, in, in addition to other viruses, including pox viruses. And uh, this, this study just highlights and, and tells us perhaps NK cells arose in mammals to protect us against things like herpes viruses and most, that most of us control and go latent, but in individuals that specifically lack NK cells or NK cell function, um, the, this viral infection can be problematic. And in many subsequent um, studies that have identified individuals with NK cell deficiency in either number or function, um, in most of these individuals, they come into the clinic presenting of severe viral infection and often herpes virus infection. Uh, this was a, uh, I, I found this in the New York Times a, a couple of years ago, and it, it was, it kind of, this was during the height of the Zika epidemic. And this uh, science writer keenly noted that uh, CMV actually impacts far more newborns than Zika, and yet we don't really pay that much attention to CMV, but it does have an impact on, on human health. And I thought it was interesting that during the height of um, a different viral pandemic that this, this person keenly noted um, the impact CMV has. Um, so the, the title of my talk was, was uh, The Innate and Adaptive Responses of NK Cells. NK Cells obviously are lumped under innate immunity, so have these rapid responses, and that's highlighted in this cartoon uh, from a review that uh, postdoc Adriana in the lab wrote recently. And um, here it highlights how NK cells can respond um, to environmental insults. So some of the inf inflammation during infection that, that they encounter, um, they can rapidly kill as, as their name implies. Um, Eva Klein first described these cells as having this natural killing ability in, in the 70s. And, um, and to this day, we, we still appreciate how they can rapidly kill without prior sensitization. Um, they can also uh, 
secrete pro-inflammatory cytokines such as interferon gamma and mediate some of these early responses that happen within hours of an infection. And then um, I also already highlighted these adaptive features, how um, following this innate period, um, there are subsets of NK cells that can undergo these clonal bursts and um, drive these adaptive features, if, if you will. <clears throat> um, and so, so the experimental setup in, in which we first described these responses is a very simple one. And uh, like Jeff mentioned, I originally trained with Mike Bevan. And so we would do things like take our favorite PCR transgenic, and in this case, the OT1, which, which Chris Hoquist made back in the day, take these OT1 cells, transfer them into a mice, hit them with, with a pathogen that expresses ovalbumin and, and watch the, you know, the, the cells go gangbusters. And so I, I took a similar approach when, when we start working with NK cells. And so here I'm transferring congenically distinct NK cells, wild type NK cells into a mouse that lacks Li49H. Now this mouse has a normal NK cell compartment, um, normal numbers, it just simply lacks that activating receptor, such that when you transfer these wild type NK cells in, those are the only ones that are responding specifically to CMV, and you can track that response. And the, the flow plots above highlight, um, use this pointer. Yeah, th this highlights how um, a small number of NK cells that are transferred can expand into a pretty big population. And highlighted on the right here are uh, the expansion of these cells in the different peripheral organs, including. Um, uh, spleen, liver, lung, kidney, and lymph nodes. And in just about every tissue we look, we look at, you're able to find these cells. And you can see that the transferred cells have expanded to pretty significant numbers, uh, upwards of 60 or 70% of the entire NK cell population. And then when we look at these same mice 50 days later, this is where we were pretty surprised to find that these cells still persist. And we've gone out to 180 days in these experiments and you know, six months in the lifespan of a mouse could be equivalent to decades in human. And so, um, yeah, sure. <clears throat> Yeah. So, so there, because Li forty nine H, at least it's it's expression in the the B six mouse. So it's not in every strain of of mice. In the B six mice, it's at a pretty high frequency, and so um, there, you get outcompete. You get some expansion of these transferred cells, but it gets outcompeted by the host. You can imagine like putting an OT1 mouse in, into, or OT1 cells into an OT1 mouse. It's, it's kind of analogous to, to that. Um, they will divide and, and you get nice CFSE peaks, but in, not to this extent. <clears throat> and so really we're trying to model what happens in human and highlighted below on these flow plots are CMV seronegative individuals where you see a very small population of this NKG2C positive population. And here's one individual that probably recently was infected or, or reactivated for CMV. And you can find this population at a very high numbers and, and this uh, CD57 being an activation marker. But if you just sample, for example, everyone in this room, we're gonna, you know, 70% of us probably carry CMV latently and we're gonna be found at different NKG2C positive pop percentages um, because we're taking snapshots here. <clears throat> this was a study from Lewis Lanier's lab. The first, to me, a longitudinal study was this one from Hans Gustav Lundgren's group where they tracked a Hanta virus outbreak. And this was a retrospective study where they found that these folks in Northern Sweden that were exposed to hantavirus came into the clinic presenting of, um, of symptoms and 
they were able to track these the, the NK cells in the blood of these folks longitudinally. And what you see is this expansion of the NKG2C positive population, a contraction phase, and then elevated numbers out to over a year. And um, what was interesting is um, these folks showed in a subsequent study that it's not the hantavirus that's driving this response, but CMV. So you only find this type of response in CMV seropositive individuals, suggesting that the hantavirus is probably driving CMV um, out of latency, and that's what's pushing this response. They had a couple of subsequent studies that, that described this. So you don't see this response in a CMV seronegative individual. But to me, it was one of the first pieces of evidence that you can get this clonal expansion and, and memory in, in human against CMV as well. Um, I'm going to highlight a, a very quickly a study that um, two really talented postdocs um, performed. This work is published, so I'm going to show it very quickly and, and then highlight two studies that, um, that are unpublished. And I really need your guys' feedback on because uh, I'm not an expert in, in this type of epigenetic analysis. Um, but Colleen Lau recently started her own lab at, at Cornell um, and Gabby Weedman uh, at, at the Technical University in Munich under um, uh, Dirk Bush is, is head of that group. Um, and so what they did was um, they looked at the transcriptome and the epigenome of the NK cells as they transitioned from naive to factor to memory. And they sampled at these various time points, uh, day two being the innate um, responses of NK cells where they make uh, interferon gamma robustly, day four as they're undergoing this proliferative burst uh, day seven being the peak of that burst, um, an early contraction time point and a, and a late memory time point. And what they found was the transcriptome um, by RNA-seq and chromatin accessibility by ATAC-seq generally tracks together in these early time points. This day 14 time point was, was kind of a curiosity. Um, you know, by, trans, by transcript, uh, this day 14 looked like a day seven effector. And this is similar to what Sukak and others have described, Rafi Ahmed and others have described for um, effector T cells that you don't get a true memory cell until um, at least a month or so out. And they, no, no self-respecting memory T cell person would probably call day 14 a memory cell. Um, and surely by transcript, they look like effector cells. But by chromatin accessibility, it's kind of interesting. This day 14 population clusters closer to the memory cell. So even though by transcript, they still look like an effector, perhaps there are some chromatin modifications that are already poising them um, to that memory, towards that memory state. And this is something we're, we're still thinking about. Um, but for the remainder of this section, I, I want to focus on these early time points, because this is where we found um, a strong correlation when we did pathway analysis um, for genes that are correlated between chromatin accessibility and transcription. And some of our favorite pathways came up, including the pro-inflammatory cytokine signal. So we know type 1 interferon, NK cells can respond to a whole, whole host of pro-inflammatory cytokines, including type 1 interferons, work through a STAT1, STAT2 heterodimer along with IR9, IL12, which predominantly uses phosphorylated STAT4, which homodimerizes and translocates the nucleus. And then kind of less pro-inflammatory, but more homeostatic cytokines like IL15, which are required throughout the lifespan of an NK cell and, and, um, and signal through uh, phosphostat5. And we know that um, there is a window in which, at least during CMV infection, in which these cytokines uh, are produced and then um, go back to baseline. So between about days one and three, uh, 
you get this peak in type 1 interferon, IL-12, IL-2 and 15, also IL-18, across these different tissues. And uh, they quickly go back to baseline. Um, and NK cells are sensing these signals because we can pull the NK cells at these time points and look for phosphorylation of STAT1 downstream of type 1 interferon, or STAT4 downstream of IL-12, and STAT5 downstream of IL-2 and 15. And you can see that the, the phosphorylation peaks at about day two and then starts coming back down to baseline. <clears throat> and we know that these stats are important in driving this adaptive response. So even though they're sensed in this early window between days two and three, they can drive, um, they can impact the later responses. So if you look at a STAT1 deficient or STAT4 deficient NK cell, they are crippled compared to the wild type in mounting these adaptive responses. Uh, if you get rid of STAT5, you ablate NK cell development completely because IL-15 is required for their development. And so here in this experiment, we took away one copy of STAT5. So, but even in a HET setting, you can see that STAT5 is impactful and you don't get uh, the same response you see in wild type. So these stats seem to play an important and yet non-redundant role um, in NK cell response to CMV. And just to wrap up Gabby and Colleen's study, this is a graphical abstract of, of what they found basically when they start to deconvolute um, these different signals. And um, they, they, the highlight is basically, and you can have a look at their paper if you're interested in it, um, during viral infection in either us or in mice, these various cytokines are produced. NK cells can sense them. What they found was STAT1 typically targets the promoters of the genes and um, induces transcriptional impacts, whereas STAT4 and STAT5 preferentially bind to non-promoter regions. So they'll bind upstream or downstream of, of the gene body in, in intergenic regions or, or bind to introns, um, and they target the promoters a lot less. Um, what they also showed was you get a synergy between the genes that are induced by STAT4 and STAT5. You get antagonism of STAT4 with STAT1, uh, which actually Christine Byron um, suggested um, in a study back in the 90s. Um, but we looked at this antagonism at a transcriptional level. And so it basically validated what, what she had published um, two decades prior to this. Um, and then the summary of, of all these uh, signals is that you get a feedback inhibition. And it suggests to us that because NK cells are such potent effector cells, if, you know, as soon as you activate them with these cytokines, you probably need to shut them off. Um, and so uh, these are different ways that folks in the clinic and and, and elsewhere are, are starting to manipulate these cells. Um, some of these cytokines are being provided to NK cells as, as you grow them up and then reinfuse um, leukemia patients, for example. And so uh, hopefully this will inform. Yeah, Steve. Sure. Is there any difference in these responses for the antigen specific versus bulk NK cells? Yeah, so this was actually done, oh no, the, the, this study, the, the previous one was done on the, the antigen specific, the Li49H, but th this was probably done on bulk NK cells. My guess is um, they, they'll respond pretty similarly transcriptionally against these cytokines, because whether you express the Li49H or don't, they can respond to cytokines similarly. You can read out um, interferon gamma with IL-12 and 18, pretty similarly. They grow up um, with IL-2 and 15 pretty similarly. So. Oh, that I, I do think. And, and we, we have, have a subsequent study where now we're adding the antigen receptor on top of these signals. So um, I definitely think that's signal one, if you will, um, will impact uh, their, their responses. <clears throat> 
we're finding kind of a interestingly similar uh, profiles between receptor triggering and IL-18, probably because they both induce NF-kappa B, and so they're driving more similar signals than these STAT-induced. <clears throat> And so um, moving forward, this, this uh, unpublished study um, by a grad student in the lab, uh, Andy Santosa, he, he began to take this epigenetic approach one step further and to ask about the, the, the spatial and temporal dynamics of chromatin um, that shape NK and T cell responses because um, we can look at these responses side by side during CMV infection in the same host. And we know that when we look at chromatin modifications or accessibility, we're looking um, at the nucleosome or, or um, linear DNA level, and we often draw it linearly, but we know that chromatin folds in 3D space, and you get things like chromatin loops, you get um, clustering in, in domains, um, you have uh, euchromatin, which, which is found in these, um, these A compartments, and then heterochromatin, which is um, denser and less active in these uh, B compartments. And this is one way we can look at um, our high C data, which allows analysis um, of these, um, these compartmentalized um, domains in, within the genome. And so um, in this next set of experiments, I wanted to show you what we found, at least the beginnings of what we found with, with chromatin looping and, and where genes fall within these euchromatin, heterochromatin uh, domains. And so I think most of you are familiar with, with high c It allows you to, to look at this chromosomal compartmentalization. And um, when you look at, so far we've only collected a few time points. So we have naive T cells, day seven T cells. Um, these are pulled with tetramer. And then um, for NK cells, we have the day zero, the day two, and then the day seven. And you can see the T cells sort of cluster together and NK cells separately. If you add a very different cell type, like the myeloid cells, like a macrophage population, you can see that these um, NK and T cells cluster closer together, so they're more similar than, than an, a less related cell. Um, and that's highlighted in this dendrogram where um, actually the day seven cells, the T and NK, cluster closer together. Um, and then the naive T cell is probably more distinct than, than these other uh, populations, but the macrophage is, is the most distinct. Now, I was mentioning the, the A and B compartments, and this is an analysis you can do with, with um, high C. And so here we're just comparing a naive T cell to a naive NK cell. So, so you can see that by and large, the A compartments between these two cell types here in red and the B compartments um, are very similar between NK cells and T cells. And the the, there's a small sliver of, um, of regions that are distinct between these. So they're, they're B in, in, in T cell and A in NK or, or the opposite. And, and you can find some of these genes that fall in these compartments. So they're up in NK cells or up in T cells. And some of these are lineage specific. For example, here, KLF12, which is um, found in the NK cell compartment, in the A compartment, but B in the T cell, and you get um, transcription uh, in the NK cells, but not the T cells. And then, uh, for example, a T cell specific uh, gene themis, which is found in the A compartment in T cells, but B in the NK, and you only get transcription in, in the T. Um, and um, you can highlight um, differences as the cells differentiate as well. And, and yet, kind of interestingly, most of the genome 
I, I guess I didn't appreciate this enough. Mo most of it doesn't change during even differentiation. We think of a, for example, of a, a day seven T cell compared to an IE T cell as being very different. You know, they're blasting, they're producing all these factors, they're proliferating, and yet most of so here we're looking at a naive t cell compared to day seven and most of the a region and b regions are are remaining so you, you get a, again a small sliver of genes that are transitioning from a from euchromatin to heterochromatin and vice versa but and you know we measure some of the outputs as large effects things like killing production of interferon gamma or il2 you know, proliferation, cell cycle related genes, metabolism, and, and yet that only represents, you know, this small sliver. For the most part, these A and B compartments remain static. Um, and similarly for NK cells, when you transition from day zero to two or two to seven, you can see these, for, for the most part, the, the genome is, is compacted and, and remain in their A and B compartment. So you get small slivers of genes that change. Um, one thing that we were able to observe when we compared the uh, genome architecture of uh, naive to factor T cells is, um, as has been described, I think, throughout the, the decades, activated T cells sort of become NK-like. And this is also shown to be true at the architecture level. So with this high C analysis, these effectors T cells start to cluster closer by PC1 to the NK cell compartments. And when you compare this effector to naive change, you find a lot of NK related genes, effector genes, um, things like ZAB2, uh, TBAT, and various other granzymes and perforins. And as they become more killer, um, in a factor function, they, they start to cluster closer to the NK cells. What's kind of interesting is you can look at how the chromatin is looping through the high C analysis. And um, interestingly, and so when you get a chromatin loop, you, you have two anchors right, that are brought together. And, and one end of the anchor is highlighted here. Um, the other is highlighted here, uh, I and J. And this is for arresting um, NK cell day zero and then day two. And you can see that most of the loops are happening in these intergenic regions. So they're not looping, they're less looping to the promoter, but in fact um, to intergenic or intronic regions. And that's highlighted in the red for the anchors and even at day two. So, so it seems like for the genes that are um, being activated and, and induced, um, the looping is, is, is occurring around the gene body for the most part. Um, so an example of, of this, when you look at this high dimensional map and then zoom in on specific genes like here, the granzyme B locus, again, you can see the granzyme B is here, but the looping um, sort of spans the exterior of the gene body. Um, this is uh, day zero for NK cells and day two. And you can see that the looping here increases around this gene and we see transcript increase. <clears throat> um, for interferon gamma, it looks a little bit different. So, the, so here's gamma and you can see that the the local looping around the, the gene body doesn't seem to change that much. You can see the red lines here and the orange lines are about the same in density, but these distant um, looping seems to increase. And so it seems like, and of course we know that interferon gamma increases in transcript significantly when the cells become activated at day two. Um, and so there seem to be these different modes of um, regulation, whether it be uh, local around the gene body or, or distal interactions, and these span um, many megabases. Um, here again is, is a T cell and NK cell comparison between day zero and seven. You can see that the changes around these, these TADs um, are 
very significant in the T cells, but less so in the NK cells, perhaps suggesting that the NK cells are already poised at these loci. Um, the chromatin architecture is already established such that they can readily make interferon, whereas the T cell has to rearrange its architecture around this site. Um, and this correlates with, with what we find with chromatin accessibility. Uh, you get a huge increase. Uh, this isn't gamma, I'm sorry. This is the granzyme locus. Um, but nonetheless, you, you see an increase in, in this region for chromatin accessibility, whereas with NK cells, they are already poised. Um, and this is reflected at the transcript level as well. Um, yeah, this is gamma, where, where you get these slight increases in, in genome architecture um, in the T cells, less so in the NK cells. It's kind of this interesting region where um, you get less looping just beyond the interferon gamma loci. Um, and we're not sure what that means. Perhaps there's a regulatory region. Um, you know, John O'Shea has described uh, gamma regulating region downstream of the, the loci and, and it, it falls in, in this region. And you, you seem to get less interactions here, um, but it, it does correlate again with chromatin accessibility and transcript. Um, and from this high C analysis, we can look directly at a single gene here, interferon gamma, and, and perhaps identify new uh, distal enhancers. So here there are two enhancers that we're, we're trying to focus on where um, in NK cells, this looping occurs. And we've actually been able to CRISPR out one of these um, distal putative enhancers. And, and we actually see a decrease in gamma production when we target uh, this region by CRISPR compared to um, a control guide RNA. We find this when we stimulate the NK cells with IL-12 and 18 or with a uh, receptor. And this, this purple points highlight that region that's CRISPRed out. And this is something like, I think it's like 600 kb upstream of the gamma loci. And so we're, we're kind of curious whether this also regulates gamma and T cells as well. But through this high C analysis, we can find these uh, perhaps enhancer regions that are that are quite distal. Now, I think Ken Murphy has has done this for DCs and, and have found various regions that are pretty far upstream of genes like BADF that can regulate um, DC development. This this one is actually quite a bit further, so it's it's curious. And then we have one downstream that we'd like to target and also test whether. Um, something really distal, spanning many genes and, and many kilobases will, um, will impact um, effector cytokines like gamma. Um, let's see. So yeah, so th these are some of, the, uh, some of the observations we've made thus far. We're, we're still trying to make sense of all the data. If, if folks in the audience um, have some expertise in this area, I'm, I'm all years. This is this not an area where where I have any expertise, and so um, we're we're learning as we go. But um, my student Andy is is making pretty good progress and mm -hmm. and finding some really interesting observations. Doctor sir, a quick question. This is a bit of a basic question, but if you look at your live forty nine H positive negative N cases, are there any heterogeneity in the ability to go to either a memory phenotype or not? And do you see and if you compare those to, let's say, T cells that are memory precursors or shorter wave effectors, can you see similarities? Yeah, so definitely uh, to Steve's earlier point, you, you need Li49H or NKG2C on the human counterpart to drive these adaptive responses. If you don't have what, what, I, what is analogous to TCR or signal one in the NK cell, then you can't drive this response. Um, what was your other question? Do, do all of the, oh, the, the slack and MPAC. Yeah. yeah. So one of my um, former postdocs, Tim O'Sullivan, who now has his own lab at UCLA, had a paper out recently where he suggests that NK cells may also, early in their development, have some that um, 
that are driven towards a more effector um, state and undergo higher effector functions, but don't persist as long. And then there are other subsets that are more memory prone, if you will. And he uses, I think, Li6C and the transcription factor Li1 to, to segregate these populations. So uh, I think the word is still still out, but or, or we, we still need further investigation, but there seem to be some parallels along those lines as well. And uh, in the remaining um, 15 minutes or so, I wanted to highlight one other study that, that we're, is still in progress, but, but I'd like to get your guys' feedback on. And it's um, a study that a postdoc, uh, Adriana Muhal, like, like me, she, trained as a T cell biologist. She's, she's from um, Max Crummel's lab originally. And um, she's been asking whether there are specific organs that um, allow for NK cell expansion or are more permissive. And um, she revisited some of my earlier data where, where I showed that NK cell expansion can happen in all these different organs, both lymphoid and non-lymphoid. And she looked at a tighter time course and found that the spleen and K cells actually don't really peak at day seven. They, they peak much earlier. You get this burst between days four and five. So previously, I just sampled day zero and then day seven, because that's, that's what T cell folks do. And so that's, that's what I did. Um, but she, she looked at it with, with greater granularity and found that there's this burst in the spleen at day five that doesn't happen um, at other sites. So if you look in the blood, they don't peak until day seven. There, you get a delayed kinetics, and you see this delayed kinetics in other organs too, like the liver and the peritoneal cavity where we inject the virus. Um, so she was wondering if the spleen provided a, a favorable environment for this early priming of, of NK cells. Um, what she did was um, she took splenic and liver NK cells um, one day after priming in a V6 mouse and transferred them into an infection matched mouse and um, then tracked the response of these cells in either the spleen or liver. So, so it's a little bit complicated, but basically she found that if you were primed in the spleen early on, you have a much better outcome. And so, so these were co-transferred spleen and liver populations. Uh, they were congenically distinct. They were normalized in number and put into the, the second mouse. And you can see that if they saw, if they were primed originally in the spleen, they did much better, whether they then ended up in the spleen or the liver. So there's something about this early splenic environment that already programs the cells to be um, a little bit different. Um, she also then did this experiment that, that I'm still trying to interpret, but she transferred NK cells into a splenectomized mouse. So her thought was perhaps because NK cells circulate, right, perhaps this early priming in the spleen then allows for the seeding of other organs. And typically we sample at day seven when, when the NK cells have proliferated and, and gone everywhere. And she, when she takes away the spleen, it seems to impact pretty significantly the overall numbers um, in these other compartments, suggesting, and you might want to interpret this various ways, but suggesting that perhaps the early, again, the early spleen priming is impactful um, and perhaps you, you don't get the same degree of priming if you, if you lack this organ site. Um, we want to look at you know, find some clues as to what might be different about the spleen primed NK cells. And so um, this was from Colleen's earlier transcriptional analysis where we looked at um, day zero versus day two cells in the spleen and compared them to uh, liver NK cells. And you can see that a Li49H NK cell from either organ generally have the same transcriptional profile based on this diagonal. But there are a few genes that um, are accentuated in the splenic NK cells. And 
some of these point towards pointed us towards the TNF pathway. Highlighted here are just a few of these genes, and there were some from this pathway. And so um, it reminded us that when we looked at this early correlation of chromatin accessibility to transcriptome, one of the pathways that also popped up was the TNF pathway. Um, and you can see based on ATAC and RNA, um, a lot of these genes from the TNF pathway fall along this di diagonal. Um, we were curious whether NK cells were expressing the receptor for TNF. Um, we did find that TNF R2 gets bumped up during infection. TNF R1 isn't expressed um, at significant levels in NK cells throughout. So if there's any signaling, it is probably going to be through TNF R2. And this bump in TNF is partially CD4 dependent. So if you take away uh, C or not C, STAT4. So if you take away the IL-12 signaling through STAT4, you don't get a similar degree of upregulation of this receptor. And so early on when the NK cells are sensing the inflammatory environment, it seems to turn TNF R2 up. And at the same time that TNF R2 is induced on NK cells, we looked at TNF alpha expression in various different splenic populations. So you have the macrophage populations, various dendritic cell populations, here neutrophils, and you see induction of, of TNF in, in all of these cell types. And I was talking to, to Steve and Chris last night about this a little bit, and potentially in non hematopoietic cells are, are also expressing TNF, including possibly stroma. <clears throat> but it seems to correlate with the time point in which NK cells are expressing the receptor, these cytokines are being made. So we were curious whether TNFR2 impacts either the innate, the early innate functions or, or the later adaptive functions. When we looked at some of the early activation markers like CD69 or 25, these get induced on NK cells at day two, um, but are diminished or less expressed in the TNFR2 knockout NK cells. Uh, interferon gamma is also down. <clears throat> so it seems like this signal might be required uh, for the production of, of this effector cytokine. Um, folks in the field, I think, will be able to tell you that often uh, NK cell people like to throw IL-12 and 18 at these cells in order to induce interferon gamma. But here, TNF can be a surrogate for 18. So IL-12 and along with TNF gives you gamma levels that are comparable, um, not quite as high as 18, but, but comparable. Um, and if you block here, TNF R1 or R2, it's definitely R2 that is driving this response. So as I mentioned, NK cells don't express a lot of TNFR1. And so block, using this blocking antibody while you treat with IL-12 and TNF don't really impact the interferon gamma response, but, but it is substantially impacted when you add um, anti-TNFR2. Um, so this is kind of complicated, but we start to ask, um, what happens downstream of TNFR2? And so we went to the literature because I'm not much of a signaling person, but downstream of TNFR2, the, the signals are pretty complicated and you get canonical NF kappa B signaling, but you also get this non canonical pathway. And so what Adriana did was to start to dissect what signals downstream of this receptor may be playing a role in. Um, in production of interferon gamma. And so she used inhibitors against uh, junk, PI3 kinase, this uh, NIK, which, is, which drives the non-canonical pathway. And you can see that different levels of these inhibitors, you don't impact interferon gamma. She then targeted uh, P38 and um, the NF kappa B components. And here, she did see a, a significant drop in the ability of these cells to make interferon gamma when you inhibit this canonical NF-kappa-B and MAP kinase signaling pathway. <clears throat> she wanted to then look at the adaptive side of the response to see if uh, TNFR2 
impacts the ability of the NK cells to expand. And here on, so she transferred the cells um, at equal ratios. And by day four, you can already start to see this skew in uh, the wild type and the knockout. And by day five, you, you see that it's, it's pretty profoundly in, in favor of the wild type. Um, and when she CTV labels these cells, you can see that by day four, the wild type have already pretty much diluted their CTV, whereas the knockout are, are slow to proliferate. Um, and that early burst that you find in the spleen, so here in the wild type, um, is largely blunted when you take away TNFR2, <clears throat> suggesting that perhaps, again, it's that TNFR2 signal TNF sensing in the spleen that is driving that early burst between days four and five. Um, she then, we, we then realized there, there are various ligands for TNFR2, including TNF, but also lymphotoxin. And so she wanted to rule out that lymphotoxin was impacting this response. So we blocked lymphotoxin or TNF. And it is indeed TNF that impacts this ability of the NK cells to expand. If you give uh, lymphotoxin, it doesn't impact their expansion. Um, and then we want to get at uh, how TNF was programming the cells uh, differently. And when you look at the transcript between wild type and knockout cells, you see very few differences early on actually. And it's, it's not until day four that you find um, at least a thousand genes that are up or down um, in wild type compared to knockout. And some of these correlated with uh, cell cycle pathways and DNA replication and uh, suggesting, uh, um, confirming that, that it is a proliferative defect. And interestingly, in knockout, you find an enhancement of some of these uh, interferon and, and receptor mediated processes, which I'll get back to in, in a sec. Um, some of these genes here, this is day four, and, and this cluster of genes highlights some of the cell cycle regulators. Um, when we look at the G0, G1 phase, they, the knockout seem to be stuck here and can advance to the S or, or drive cell division as efficiently as wild type. <clears throat> um, there's this other cluster of genes where um, with NK cells, as they're activated, I showed you on day two, they induce um, activation markers like CD69 and 25, but by day four, they downregulate these, um, these receptors and genes. And here um, on day four, you can see that some of these genes remain elevated. So they, they can't repress the genes that are supposed to come down uh, following um, activation, including um, things like interferon and NK receptor signaling related genes. <clears throat> so there seems to be a dysregulation in, in their activation and differentiation. And, and then finally, with this um, non canonical NF kappa B signaling pathway, we, we find some of these genes that are uh, dysregulated um, and, and less induced in uh, the TNFR two knockouts. And when we um, found an NIK knockout here, which ablates this non-canonical uh, pathway, uh, these NK cells seem to be impacted in their ability to um, undergo expansion. So here we're looking at a ratio of knockout to wild type. And um, interestingly, we made these mixed bone marrow chimeras. And even at before we infect, they seem to be skewed in favor of the wild type. So perhaps this non-canonical pathway is, is driving even their development. But certainly when we infect, this is now day seven, and you can see that it's skewed nine to one in, in favor of the wild type. So this non-canonical pathway seems to be important in driving this adaptive response. So I'm just gonna end here. So far, our working model is that the spleen provides this early niche for priming of these NK cell responses 
um, perhaps at least in part through TNFR2 signaling. Um, and yeah, the, I won't highlight these bullet points again. <clears throat> um, I, I think I already gave these folks credit, but the epigenetic work was was launched by Colleen and Gabby, who have both are both running their own labs. Andy was a grad student who did the high C work, Adriana, the uh, TNF and spleen work. Um, a lot of this was done in collaboration with John O'Shea's group, um, at least the epigenetic work. Um, there's some human NK cell stimulation data that I didn't show you that um, was helped with by Kathy Shu at Sloan Kettering. Um, Christina Leslie is a bioinformatician at MSK that helped us with, with some of the computational analysis. Um, I get a lot of feedback from, from Lewis and Sasha, so I like to pick their brains for, for a lot of this work. And these are the folks that have funded this work. So um, thank you for your attention. So I've got a question about the last part, TNFR2. Did you look at um, effects on STAT5 signaling at all? And I bring that up just because for Tregs, TNFR2 signaling, as well as Gitternox 40, but TNFR2 certainly um, essentially sensitizes them. They're about tenfold more sensitive to IL-2 than their TNFR2 negative counterparts. Is it through an induction of 25 or, or it's that unclear itself. i mean 25 goes up a little bit yeah. but not that, really that enough is, you'd think that yeah that that's what we haven't looked at that but that that's something we can do and k cells at least at this time point they do induce 25 but they also send sil 15 through 122 in the gamma the common gamma chain yeah i don't we haven't looked at stat 5 but that that could be a potential mechanism for their survival and, and division. Cycle. Yeah, we, uh, that's a good suggestion. Yeah. Just regarding the last part, I'm just curious, how does TNFR2 signaling interact with inhibitory receptors like KIRS? Because those are also required for NK cell licensing. So I'm just wondering how, how those two pathways interact, especially when it comes to CD69 down regulation and all. Yeah, we, we, ha we haven't looked at inhibitory receptors we, we can so in the mouse system we can use li 49 c and, and li 49 i to to interrogate the the populations within the li 49 h population that also express the inhibitory or don't and, and look for um functional differences when you have or don't have tnfr2 uh, we, we we haven't looked at whether there's any kind of um, synergy or antagonism. Yeah. Hey, Steve. Joe, quick question. Yeah. You know, you know, this was coming. Uh, you know, the, the idea of memory yeah. in K cells. You're looking in a model where there is persistent infection in CNB or in CNB. Yeah. I forget. Now, I mean, if, if, the, if you take the NK cells away from a source of uh, CMB or if you inducibly delete a Y49 in the mouse model, a uh, Y49H in the mouse model, do they decay or do they continue to persist like a you know, memory CD8 T cell, which is TCL independent? Yeah, so that was one of the first questions I, I asked in, in Lewis's lab once we had established this model, right? Because uh, Sue Keck, Steve Schoenberger, and others showed that a, a short amount of TCR triggering can then lead to this, as Pam and Mike described, this autopilot response. Where, uh, and so we did, or I, when I was in Lewis's lab, I did a similar experiment where I took um, NK cells that had been primed um, in the infection model. I think I pulled them at day seven at the peak of the effector response and also at like day 30 at once they've established the memory and park them in a naive host to see if they persist. And they they do persist like memory T cells. They don't, you know, with CD8 T cells, you you get what Mark's gone, but he calls it the, the ultra glide, right? <laughs> Where they don't really contract once they hit the memory. With NK cells, they they start to trickle and contract. So similar to maybe what's been described for CD4 memory in certain circumstances. So uh, 
Um, but that autopilot response, once they're programmed, I think also kicks in in the NK cells, probably to a lesser degree than CD8, but, and we haven't followed up since. <laughs> Do I have yeah, one quick yeah. question? So for the requirement for the spleen, is it just yeah. secondary lymphoid tissue? Is it resident NK cells? Any any insights in uh, what's driving that process? Yeah, uh, beyond TNF, um, you, you know, we think TNF is, is part of the story. It, it's probably not everything. Um, we know that within the spleen, there's, there's microarchitecture, right? And the NK cells start in the red pulp. They transition to the white pulp at day two. We actually published a paper a couple of years ago looking at neuronal NK interactions within the white pulp. And then we know that by day four, the NK cells are starting the traffic back out into the red pulp. And that's probably when they, they circulate and go to the rest of the, the body. Um, there is something about that transition into the white pulp where they're, they're getting signals. And, we're doing things like um, up impact, trying to impact their ability to traffic within the spleen to see if, you know, what happens if they don't have those white pulp interactions. But that, that's, that's actually been observed um, prior to our studies. Folks have noticed NK cells during CMV infection will do this, this transient trafficking within the red and white pulp. And they probably get locked into the spleen um, Actually, we, we don't know what the dwell time is when NK cells traffic in and out of tissues. We think of it as, as pretty fluid. We've tried some parabiosis experiments to look at the kinetics, um, but I, I don't know if, and I'm sure the dwell time within different tissues is, is going to be different. And so that, that's something, it's, it's a great question. We, we need to uh, think about ways to, to explore that. <clears throat> We're trying some some of these photo activatable systems where you shine light and zap the cells in the spleen and, and look at when they, they go elsewhere. They're a little bit tougher than, than we anticipated. Um, but those are some of the questions we are interested in. Yeah. Hi. I, so I am not an immunologist, but interested in cell signaling. Yeah. So, um, so the P38 result was interesting. And if I remembering correctly that that was, you were looking at like an early time point following the P38 inhibitor and the other inhibitors. Yeah, so those were all the inhibitor experiments, um, at least for the gamma readout, I believe those were, um, it might've been four hours, so very, very short. Okay. Cause that, that's when you, you can measure interferon gamma. If you soak NK cells in a dish, in IL-12 plus 18 or TNF, I think within four to six hours, you can read it out. So it was in that time frame. So, I mean, I think would that then suggest, I think that the, it's, it's the P38 effect is likely independent of NF-kappa B, do you think? Or do you have data suggesting that, P, that P38 activation yeah. is actually important for NF-kappa B activation? Yeah, no, we, we, we don't know that. and. I guess we can look for um, NF kappa B activated genes in the P38 inhibition and try to get at that. Or can you like look at nuclear localization of specific NF kappa B family members? Yeah, we, we've, um, so I think part, part of the difficulty is that we've tried chipping for NF kappa B to look at where it binds and it's been really challenging. I think it's been difficult in both T cells as well as NK cells. Most of the NF kappa B chip assays, I think, have been done in myeloid populations. Are and you specifically um, looking at P65 or are you looking at other NF kappa B? Yeah, that's that's well? a good question. I, I don't recall which ones. We've we've tried several different there are I think five different NF kappa B subunits. And I want to say we've tried. Yeah, I don't recall. I think P65 was one of them. Right. I guess that's kind of where you get in the difference between a more canonical and non-canonical. And people tend to like hone in on P65, you know, P60, sure. and it may be something more. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. And I think we targeted 
I K K as a to, to more directly interrogate the NF kappa beta. Yeah, and so you had some I K K one two inhibitor data, and at a high micromolar concentration, yeah. it looked like that was effective. But you know, there's also I K K epsilon and sure. T B K, yeah, and you know, so those could also be involved as well. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm just wondering if Live 49 H uh, has calcium flux when it's stimulated, such that you could look at um, calcium flux by two photon and sort of actually, you know, videotape yeah. this interaction of the spleen over time. Yeah, we we did do this in in a study previously. Um, um, a uh, grad student of mine, Nick Adams, had a paper where he looked at expression of Li49H. So Li49H is expressed, um, you know, the, there, there are low expressors of it and then high expressors. And we were looking at how they trigger exactly that calcium flux. And with a colleague of mine, Morgan Hughes, we were able to, to image um, when they ligated their targets, how much flux. Um, the, the classic calcium flux assays are very difficult to do with NK cells, I think, because you need large numbers of cells. Um, mm -hmm. But the imaging works pretty well. We're, we're starting to use it more uh, within our, our various um, stories that we're developing, but it, it, it's, a, it's been a little slow going. But we have that, that one experiment that we've published. Mm -hmm. It seems to be a pretty robust assay. Yeah, there's like a two photon reporter for ca calcium flux so you can actually there like is. Okay. see the flux it you know live okay kind of thing. yeah i think i think the one we did we throw in the classic yep, reagent sure. and get it to fire but yeah. yeah all right well thank you so much for a fabulous talk dr Sun. yeah thank you